Ну, она говорит, облако такое вроде тумана, вроде какое-то облако. Но так не пасмурно, ничего не было, говорит. А просто какое-то облако. А мы, мы глаза так собрали кверху, то ну, это, ногу дробь собралась. Вот мы жили, то есть звонит. А до сего времени знали. С 46 -го года, я говорю, мы пили и пьем все, что эту заразу, которая течет. У нас уже, знаете, 6 одноклассников от моих умерло. Ну вот девочка умерла в 20 лет, у нее первая она у нас была. Умирать не умирай, поживать не оживай. И молись. Ребята, помогите, уж мы умрем, да хоть дети умчат у меня. It takes 36 hours by train to get from Moscow to the city of Chelyabinsk. Until recently, no foreigners were allowed to go to this province in the Ural Mountains, and even Soviet citizens were required to get passes. In the late 1940s, an atomic weapons complex called Mayak was built north of Chelyabinsk. Its existence has only recently been acknowledged by Russian officials, though in fact the complex was the goal of Gary Power's surveillance flight in May of 1960. Over the years, the Mayak complex has caused three of the worst ecological disasters of the nuclear era, affecting the health of some half a million people. The train is arriving at Chelyabinsk, a city of more than a million people at the geographical center of Russia, protected by Siberia to the north and the Ural Mountains to the west. The secrecy which shrouded the region prevented news of these ecological disasters from reaching not only the outside world, but even the very inhabitants who were suffering from radiation sickness. Today, the city of Chelyabinsk is celebrating its annual winter festival. It has been estimated that the three atomic accidents have affected one out of seven people living in the Chelyabinsk province. Many of those people moved from the contaminated areas into this city. We're a tired bunch, life is sad and merry, and Chelyabinsk, the Ural lands, we will never surrender. Bureaucrats, bureaucrats, your end is coming soon. We can't get any justice from you. Many have tried and failed, say the lyrics of the Russian ditty. 70,000 Gulag inmates built Mayak in the late 40s. Stalin's head of the secret police oversaw the building of the Mayak atomic weapons complex. It was at this complex that the physicist Igor Kurchatov built the first plutonium production reactor, called Anichka, or A-reactor, in a mere 18 months. Nuclear waste was handled with equal haste. Over the next seven years, Mayak deliberately dumped radioactive waste at the source of the Tsecha River. The leader of a local environmental group, Luisa Karzova, is taking me to the site of the region's first atomic disaster. Traces of radioactivity were found as far away as the Arctic Ocean. When officials at the Mayak nuclear complex realized that the river was severely contaminated, they put barbed wire fences along its banks, 
and some of the population was evacuated, but by no means all. The four largest villages were left in place, among them Muslumova. We're on the ice. We're standing on the river. Let's give it a try. Let's see what happens. Louisa told me earlier to expect a much lower reading because of the ice. One hundred and ninety-two micro rentgens per hour. That's ten times the background radiation in the area. Fifty yards from the Tsecha lives Farida Shaimardanova. She teaches the first through third grades in Muslimova's school. Your father died, don't forget, and he was 47 too. My father-in-law died. Then a 49-year-old woman died. A 53-year-old teacher died too. There are 70, 80-year-olds because they grew up in an ecologically clean time. But the younger generation, the next generation, are going through it now, the people in their 40s and 50s. And we're next, and our children. They say it's worse for the third generation. Ferida can't explain to me why she lets her daughters play on the river, despite the dangers. It's the way people live. They know it's harmful, especially now. Children don't understand, of course, but adults certainly understand. But they do what's easier and quicker. Why go three kilometers out of your way every day, there and back, when you have housework to do, children, a husband waiting for dinner? Ferida is one of Muslimova's 4,000 residents who are waiting for a change. In the meantime, local authorities have attempted to placate residents by passing out small radiation detectors. She uses it, though she doesn't trust its results. So far it's only 15, we'll have to wait a little longer. So many years of lies have left me skeptical. We used to believe everything like idiots, and now we don't believe anything like idiots. Muslumova is about 40 kilometers downstream from the Maya complex. For decades, the people of the village were kept in ignorance about how dangerous the river was. Most of the warning finally came not from the authorities, but from local environmentalists and foreign scientists. The Muslimova hospital has 25 beds for adults and 10 for children. Food and medicine are in short supply. Gul Farida Galimova has been the village doctor for 10 years. Our children suffer from stomach and intestinal illnesses. Then they get nosebleeds. That's another problem school-age children have. And there's one more sign. Many of them have food allergies and they don't tolerate medicines well. Later they get gastritis, bronchitis. Ramil Muhammadiarov is another local teacher. His sister is here, being treated for cancer. The doctors won't tell her. She's been in the hospital three months already. She can't walk anymore, she has bed sores, and she can't sit comfortably. We don't even have the simplest bandages. The factory is over there, you probably saw it? That's where I worked. She worked there when the explosion occurred, and when they were dumping the waste. Now she's been in pain for a year and three months in the hospital. Raise your hand if you swim in the river. 
Nobody knows anything about us. Chernobyl happened, but that's Europe. The pollution reached Europe, and the whole world was upset. But us out here in the backwoods of Russia, nobody knows about it. Nobody in the world cares about the bed we've made for ourselves here. And that the children's health gets worse from year to year is no secret. It's no secret at all. Before they had rosy cheeks, but now look at them, and that's our future generation. The river River will thaw soon. The kids don't have anywhere to swim in the summer. They built a swimming pool. How many years ago was it? The pool has no water in it. So the children go swimming in the river anyway. Just ask them. To this day they swim in that river. They don't have any place else. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I've lost all my teeth too. The children's memory is just terrible. There are very few left in the class with a normal memory. Can we go swimming in the river? No. Are we going to go swimming in the river? No. Will we let our brothers and sisters swim in the river? No. We never go to the river because our river is sick. Isn't that right? When a person is sick, do you go to his house? No. And the river is sick, so we can't go visit it either. Otherwise, we'll get sick too. When Svetlana Ahmedyeva's mother died of cancer the year before, she left a good job in the city of Chelyabinsk to take care of her father in Muslimova. I came for dad. He's all alone now. I was afraid I would lose my father, too. So I came here, but I didn't really want to. I really don't want to live in Muslimova. I hate Muslimova. There are probably a lot of people who die in their 40s. Can't you take your father and leave? I ask her. People who don't know life here always ask that. Why don't you just leave? But where could we go these days? Even if we go somewhere, we can't buy an apartment. We don't have the money. This used to be my parents' room. It looks more like a storeroom now because I brought all of my things from Chelyabinsk. My mom worked in a cafeteria as a cook. Mom had asthma and she took all these hormonal medicines. They were all the only thing that kept her going. She always thought she would die from the asthma, but it was stomach cancer. I remember there was a militia man who would walk along the bank of the river. He would chase us away from the river. But for us it was a game. We would run away from him. We would hide until he had walked away, and then we would dive back in. Now, of course, I'm horrified. If someone had at least explained it to us then, we wouldn't have swum in the river. When I was little, we would take the geese there, and we would swim all the time. It was such a temptation. It's so hot in the summer, you just want to take a swim in the river. Svetlana's father is 52 years old and works on a collective farm. His name is Socialism, or Lism for short. What's the count on the pilmini so far? Thirteen? That's all right. Those two graves over there, Mama's is the one with the fence around it, and Grandma's is right next to it. You know, the average age of the people here, both the men and the women, is 50. These scientists and Japanese came to visit once? And they told us that the effects of radiation are worst of all for the third generation. 
So mom was the first, I'm the second, and it'll be worst of all for my children. And it's true, my friend's children are sick. I've been reading up on how you can get that strontium-90 out of your system. I read that you have to eat eggshells, so I've been doing it. Two weeks later, Svetlana's father has checked into a Chelyabinsk sanatorium created at the initiative of the Kish Team 57 Association. The sanatorium is located in a former trade union hospital. The sanatorium resembles a spa more than a hospital. Lizum's favorite part of the day is the bioenergy treatments. Wonderful, wonderful. All your canals are open. But we have to spend some time on your liver. The old people who didn't get the radiation lived to be 80 or 90. The people our age, 35, 40, they're dying right and left, and always from cancer. Dr. Gennady Romanov is the head of Mayak's Experimental Research Institute, created to study the effects of radiation. Which doctors? The Muslimova doctors? They're all ignoramuses. They're all ignorant about nuclear biology and radiology. They don't know anything. They're swayed by their emotions. But they say that there's a lot of cancer. I'm telling you, let's divide the situation into two groups. The situation today after 40 years and the situation in those first years. Those cancers that you see today are the result of irradiation during the first years of the plant. Cancer has a latency period of 20 years. So if the situation today is bad and if it causes cancer, then we won't see those cancers for another 20 years. That'll be when, say, around, oh, about 2015. Every three weeks, this chartered bus brings children and their parents from the contaminated villages to the Chilyabin Sanatorium. Mayak officials now admit that at least 937 people have been diagnosed with chronic radiation sickness. The actual total is apparently many times higher, since only a small percentage of the population was checked. The sanatorium has only one doctor, and it is not equipped to handle major medical problems. <laughs> Children with cancer or leukemia, for instance, are not admitted here. Many children from the contaminated area suffer from chronic skin, kidney, liver, and respiratory disorders. This is the only treatment option that the local government offers such children. The second tragic accident at the Mayak nuclear facility occurred in September of 1957. The cooling system of a waste containment unit failed, and the radioactive waste exploded with the force of 70 to 100 tons of TNT. Some 20 million curies of radioactivity were ejected into the atmosphere. 270,000 people were in areas with increased radiation levels. All the water sources in those areas were contaminated.
This building was built for the evacuees from the Bayovka orphanage. Ironically, the orphanage was the last thing to be evacuated. In fact, it was the only inhabited building in the village for over a year. Finally, two years after the accident, the authorities moved the 80 children and 30 personnel from the contaminated area. Sofia Horlenko is one of the few survivors of the Bayufka orphanage. Her husband, however, died of leukemia. She was given a one-room apartment to live in after her retirement and the equivalent of a $20 a month pension. There were abandoned cats and dogs that wandered around every night, came up to our houses. It was just terrible. When they evacuated us, they gave us a resettlement pass, 400 rubles, and made us sign a form saying that we wouldn't reveal state secrets for 25 years. Of course, we knew what that meant, and we tried to keep it confidential when we came here. People knew, of course, where we were from and were afraid of us. They thought we might be contagious. They shied away from us like people do now if you have AIDS. We couldn't leave the children, after all. But it's because of that that I've never been able to have any children of my own. I don't have any children. Now I'm left all alone in the world. Luisa Kurzova and her staff are preparing a battle plan in order to reach all of the radiation victims in the region. Some of them visit the office and fill out a form prepared by the association, but others live in remote villages. Luisa also prepares volunteers to seek out such victims. I see you have the second and third generations here. All of them, all of them, you have to check all of them. There are children and parents who live there. Those are the ones we're going to help. The inhabitants of the village of Mitlino were moved from the Tiecha River in 1956 after the contamination was discovered. The authorities moved them only a few kilometers away, however, to Balshoi Kuyash. When the explosion occurred in 1957, they were in a direct line and once again were irradiated. The villagers were resettled a second time, most of them to Balshoye Taskino, which today is again a high radiation area. <laughs> Local environmentalists are bringing me to Moiski Kubaidzulin, one of those who experienced the resettlement plan. Here the water measures 19. It's within the allowable norm, but it could be a lot lower. 20 is the maximum. And we have 19? Background radiation is 8. You mean this water is twice as dirty? I went fishing in that river, and I go there to swim, and I cut my hay there. We don't understand this. One of my daughters died, just died. We swam in that river. We drank that water. My son's sick too. He's real skinny, my oldest son. He's very sick. And my son gets these nosebleeds. And look at her back. Her spine is crooked. And she gets these bleeding sores all around. 
kurgan dara we've been living until now those chernobyl people they've been getting help but here we are we're born without arms and legs and no matter how bad things are we manage to walk and there's nowhere to go <laughs> Dr. Mira Kosenko is the head of the clinic at the Institute of Biophysics, or FEEB, where she has worked since the early 1960s. FEEB was established in order to measure the effects of radiation on the human body. The Institute has 50 beds and 15 doctors, but they take real pride in the thousands of files which record cases of radiation sickness in the area. I've asked her to show me Maisky Gubaidulin's file. The name is Gubaidulin, right? This is Maisky Gubaidulin's card. He was born in 1937. And in 1959, he was checked here and admitted for a week. He lived in Bolshoye Taskino. His body contains a lot of strontium-90, more than a thousand curies of it. They didn't know anything, and we had no right to tell them that they were irradiated. All this information was top secret. And it was a secret because of the factory where they produced weapons-grade plutonium. And no one was supposed to know its location. If someone found out that in some area there were people who had been irradiated, then it would have been possible to find the factory. That's why these people weren't given any information about radiation. The doctor had the information to treat the patient properly. He had that information. Why don't they treat people? Why can't they treat them? Why is that dissertation written on how to recognize the course of the disease? Why is it that Professor Kirushkin only defended his dissertation, but the dissertation isn't used as a manual to treat children? Why don't they treat the children? This is the children's hospital of the Chelyabinsk province. One ward is devoted to leukemia patients. This facility serves the nearly one million children who live in this province. The 30 beds on this floor are always full and the waiting list is enormous. Dr. Yelena Basharova is the director of the leukemia ward. She has been researching the incidence of childhood leukemia in the Chelyabinsk region. Her research shows that the incidence in closed towns like Mayak is twice the average. Twenty-two percent of the children survive for over five years, which is the criteria for a cure. So we simply observe them, and they're healthy without any treatment. Twenty-two percent of the patients. But the rest die. They die. Sooner or later, they die. That's the way it is. But since last year, we've been trying to use the German course of treatment. It gives them a better chance, about 50%. But in Germany, the treatment is much more intense. For the time being, we can't do that. We haven't gotten to that point yet. Three-year-old Maxime's parents and grandparents lived and worked in the Mayak atomic complex for more than 30 years. His father and grandfather eventually died of leukemia. Maxime will be seeing the most renowned orthopedic specialist at City Hospital No. 9, Dr. Naum Palak. Just a second. It's all right. It's all right. Go ahead. Stand him up on the table. 
Maxime was born without a left arm, and his right leg is shorter than his left. Dr. Pollock has seen many such cases in his long career. Don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of here. Forty-three centimeters. Bend your leg, dear. Bend your leg. In the city where I live, there are a lot of children without hands, legs, feet. Today we know that it builds up in the genes, not only the first generation, but the second, the third. It's interesting that we didn't talk about it, to tell you the truth. For one thing, we didn't know as much. But besides that, it wasn't really allowed to tell most people these kinds of things. In a word, we would look for any explanation, just as long as it wasn't connected with radioactivity. But later we found out the reasons. Look at this deformation. They operated on it when she was a child. But you can see that it grew back. It looks just like a bump. It restricts her mobility. It's a birth defect. Idris Sun Rasin has cancer of the stomach. He has been admitted to the Chilyabin Sanatorium. His village, which was located only 15 kilometers from Mayak, was leveled and the inhabitants resettled after the 1957 explosion. I remember that we were running in the woods and soldiers had surrounded our village and started to drive us back into the village. They wouldn't let us go anywhere. They wouldn't say anything. They didn't tell you what had happened? They didn't tell us anything. They didn't talk about anything. Not about the explosion, nothing. They put up posts, made a danger zone. But there was nothing said about an explosion. Maybe the adults knew about the explosion. They put you in this barrel-shaped thing. You slide in and out of it. That's how they measure the radiation. What's wrong with me, I asked. You don't have radiation sickness, they told me. And that's all they would say. Winter can be harsh in Chelyabinsk, a province in the southwestern corner of Siberia. Two members of a local environmental group are taking me to the village of Brodokolmak, where they were born and raised. They used to fish in the river. They probably still do. It's a really big fish. What's it called? A trench? The 4,000 inhabitants of this village on the banks of the Tsecha River were never evacuated. Mikhail Rydnyov is a veteran of the Second World War and a widower who lives in Brother Kolmak. The kids swim and whatnot in the river. The geese, the cows, the sheep, they're all down there. Aren't you afraid? What's there to be afraid of? The worst has happened already. The fish are still alive, after all. And there are a lot of them. And they're big like this. Trench fish. That's right, trench. Do you still fish now? Yes, yes, I fish. I fry them. Fried, all the atoms fly out of it. Today, for the first time, people who live in Bredakalmak are meeting to discuss their concerns out in the open. The school's principal and geography teacher, Dmitry Sinin, leads the discussion. 
Every third person dies of cancer. My grandfather died of cancer. Nobody dies of old age anymore. You mean when they're 70? No, not 70. Young people are dying. Young people are dying of cancer too. I know a 17-year-old girl who died of cancer. How does someone that age get cancer? Why are these young people dying? There was a young man who grazed his cattle with ours, and he died already. They already buried him. We have to do an analysis. The river was contaminated. No one explained anything to us, not even why we can't go near it. And when we ask that man, he says, that's the way it is, that's the way it is. And there were times when a militia man would stand next to the river and we would be swimming and doing laundry. They didn't know. They knew. Dmitry Semyonovich, this is serious. Why are you turning everything into a joke? I meant what I said. We still have relatives living there. And are they still dumping that filth into the river? How can you be so sure of what you say? Who runs Mayak, your brother? The woman doesn't have enough knowledge of science to yell that. I'm a geographer, and I don't know about the underground water. It was an experiment on people. We were just guinea pigs. Now I suppose we're hostages. In our school, there is a separate class that's been going on for years the fifth grade, that has been using a different program for years. We know very well that all of those children are retarded. No one talked about that before either. Now we do. How is it that suddenly we have a whole grade of retarded children? It's our radiation. We, especially you, the younger generation, should be upset. And I'm very happy that our comrade from America, who's going to do a film about us, will show everyone, and I hope the whole world finds out what sort of situation we have today in this country. Dr. Alexandra Slusaryova is making her rounds at the Brudokolmak Hospital. She suspects that she herself suffers from radiation sickness. When I started working here, that was in 1983 I came here. When our patients or outpatients would die, we were told unofficially, nothing was on paper. We were told that if people have cancer, we shouldn't write that down as a diagnosis. Write something else, anything else, either a stroke or a severe heart attack of some sort. Even chronic heart disease, basically any of those accompanying diseases. But they would only let us put down cancer as a contributing factor. But to just put down cancer as a cause of death was not allowed. We have that Institute of Biophysics in Chelyabinsk that studies these problems. But they don't inform us. I went there about four years ago as a doctor to meet my colleagues since they had done research on my generation, people born around 1953, 1954. Well, they wouldn't even tell me about the radioactivity, how much I've got of that strontium-90 in my system. I asked and they said it was a state secret. Everything here is a state secret. The location, the placement of the factory was a secret. It was a state secret. So we couldn't tell people that by living here, they were in danger of irradiation. We couldn't write down radiation sickness. We weren't allowed to. So how did we indicate it? We were given instructions to indicate it with initials. The three letters A, B, C. And whenever we see that abbreviation, and we have it on cards over there, I can show you some. All of us who work here knew that that was radiation sickness. 
In the village of Mitnino, but we weren't allowed to write even that name. You can see it's crossed out here. We only wrote it in later, when they started to allow it. In 1953, she was diagnosed with first-degree chronic radiation sickness. And then here we have second-degree chronic radiation sickness. We knew that. This is what the markings on the cards indicated. It doesn't say that it's radiation sickness, but this and this tell you that this person had radiation sickness. We know that. The level of strontium-90 is one of the factors used to determine the amount of radiation received by a person during his lifetime. Since the installation of this radiation detector, thousands of people have slid through its door. According to a study by Dr. Mira Kosenko and her colleagues, the over 28,000 people who lived along the Tsecha received an average dose of radiation 57 times higher than that received by the Chernobyl inhabitants. And for tens of thousands of people, the dose was four times greater. Before I left the region last winter, I promised the friends I made that I would return. My first visit is to Ramil Muhammadyarov, whom I met last winter when his sister was in the hospital. You left when? In March? Yes, in March, at the end of March. The end of March, around the 20th, right? After that, we took her home. She died at home, 56 years old. Every second or third family here has lost someone. I think it's abnormal. I wouldn't mind if people live to see their pensions, died of whatever, of natural causes. But this is the river. Leukemia, cancer, those are the things that kill us. Those are what kill us. The husband there died, didn't make it to 40. And the husband there died too. His wife was left all alone. He died before he was 40, I think. He was 36, 38, just like my father. Last year, a young man died of lung cancer. 40, 42 years old. That house there is empty right now. A young family lived there. The wife died, she was 28, of leukemia. Then her husband died exactly a year later. Now only their orphan daughter is left. My uncle lived in that house, 56 years old. He died of leukemia. I'll tell you everything, of course. But I only know a little Russian. My husband lived in that house. He had cancer. Roma was 50, yes. He was in... Phobe? What was it? Feeb. Feeb for five months. My daughter got sick and died right away. Your daughter was 36 last year, right? Right. These are the little girls she left. Three little girls. On his way to work, Ramil, like many other villagers, crosses this bridge over the Tietja River at least twice a day. The bridge has a radiation level 15 times higher than background radiation. It's simpler, of course, to leave, but our roots are here. Our father. We were born here. 
Where should we go? You can't run from fate. We're already irradiated. Even if we go to a clean area. I think our bodies are used to these conditions. I think we've adapted. Another Muslim of a teacher, Farida Shaimardanova, takes us to the riverbank where her daughters went sledding last winter. Since she doesn't trust the devices passed out by the local government, she has asked us to use our equipment to measure the radiation a mere 50 yards from her house. Incredible. It raises. Whoa. One hundred, one fifty, two hundred. This is insane. This is twenty five times normal background radiation. bring it down toward the fish and watch this style, what happens. It goes all the way to the bottom. Is there a lot in the fish? Yes, a very large amount. We shouldn't eat that fish? No, you shouldn't. What'll happen if you eat it? You'll get sick. We're sick anyway. That's what they mean when they say you can't infect an infection. What did they tell you in school about coming here? That the river is contaminated? With what? Uh, chemicals? There's an electric station. Whoa. That one. And this? This is... Hovering around one, so that's the highest rating so far. <laughs> the radiation is high here. You shouldn't be here. Don't stand there. <laughs> the level of radiation we just measured is 50 times higher than the normal background radiation. In 1967, the third ecological disaster struck the region. Radioactive dust swept over the countryside when Lake Karachai, a makeshift waste containment basin, dried out during a drought. Over 2,700 square kilometers and 40,000 people were affected. A hundred meters from the river, we meet Lena Morozova. She suffers from cancer of the stomach. Of course we're going to die. What's there to be optimistic about? It's better to believe. I've got no home. No medicine. How are things going to get better? Nobody's going to cure me. Who needs me? Who needs me? My God. The individual doesn't mean anything to us. It's the people. The people got used to it. But all alone, what can I do? I have to bring up my children. Take care of them so that at least they won't be sick. Idris Sunrasin, who was diagnosed with stomach cancer, 
has come home from the sanatorium in Chelyabinsk. He has lost another 10 pounds. Be careful there. Don't rip the net. Haul it in carefully. After Idris's sons catch five fish on the lake, he invites me back to his home in Argayash. There's no running water today in the Sunrasin apartment. <laughs> You had an aunt, the oldest of my three sisters. She lived about three kilometers from here. She had cancer too, of some internal organ. They did two operations, but it didn't help. It didn't help. Another sister lived in the Stavropol region from 1954. She has her own family, children, cancer. She's younger than me, my younger sister. She died of cancer too. Your uncle, my older brother, he got an intestinal disease. Probably cancer, too. They took him to the hospital. He died. Your grandfather died in Kuslin. He was in the hospital. They let him check out. There was nothing they could do for him. Grandma had a tumor, too. She died in 1954. She was 43-44. She died young too. We're already contaminated, and we get along that way. But some people can't live with the contamination, and they die from it. Probably all of the Urals are contaminated. And we live in that contamination. We swim in the contaminated lake. But we'll be fine. We'll probably live to be 50 or so. But people who move here, they can't live here too long because they come from Moscow or abroad, and the air there is clean. Well, cleaner. And that's why they can't manage for too long here. And that's why people die so quickly. Dinner's ready. Come into the kitchen. How many people died? Not one. Not one. Not a single person died. What about afterwards? No one died afterwards either. We have no evidence of any sort that anyone died, either as a direct result of the explosion or as a result of illness caused by it. There is no evidence. No one died. Sofia Hralenko is a retired teacher from the Bayufka orphanage. The village was evacuated a year after the explosion but the authorities left the orphanage in the empty town for another year before its children and personnel were moved. The building was here, L-shaped, and right here, this is the first floor. And there were steps going up, game rooms, and this was the cafeteria. Over there was the well. That's where we could get our clean water. 
It's such a beautiful place. You know, even after all this time, it breaks my heart that we had to leave here. This bush was absolutely tiny, and now look how big it's gotten. I can't stand it. I feel so bad. I wish so much that we hadn't had to leave. There were 30 of us. Only seven are still alive. The rest have died. Even the children. Some of them died while they were still children, not long after we resettled. Some a year, some two after, and some maybe 10 years after. Some had leukemia, but most often it was cancer of various internal organs. Anissa Nineyeva's family was resettled when she was only four. Today we are taking her to measure the radiation in her grazing lands for the first time. Point two went off the scale. Let me go times ten. It's very high. Pretty constant. This is the highest we've seen. And we're not even closer to the river. It's almost twice what we see in Muslimova. It's higher, right? It is 100 times normal background radiation. What do you do here? We cut hay. This is where we cut hay, right here, this grass. This is what we feed our cattle. That's our field. The animals eat the grass, the children drink the milk. I'm just amazed. I didn't think it could be so high. How many years have you been doing it? Well, how many years? Well, as long as I can remember, and I'm 38. I was born in 1953. They resettled us in 56. But we kept these fields by the river. We all cut hay here. Half the village cuts hay here along the river. We all cut hay. And no one ever said anything? Who's going to say anything? They only started talking about it two years ago. We don't have Geiger counters. We don't have anything. I don't even know how much there is in my own field. How would I know? Where am I going to go? Who else is going to give me land? And where else am I going to get hay? So that's how it is. The needles even buried there, almost. So that's it. What are we supposed to do now? We've got to leave here. They told me when I, when I uh, checked out the meter that not to stay in an area if the meter... I asked them, when would you leave uh, to, if you were looking at this? And they said, when would you leave an area? And they said, when the needle gets buried, when the needle gets buried. And on the times one it was buried, on the times 10 it was buried, um, the times 100, it, it was getting up there. So this is the highest area we've seen, definitely. <laughs> 